Hey everyone, it's Tori. I know that you've come here for fun and games and I do still want to provide that for you. But before we get to this week's episode, I'd like to hold some space to discuss the recent murder of George Floyd and the subsequent events that have happened in the US and all around the world. I've been thinking a lot about using, although it's small, this platform I have to acknowledge the historical and ongoing racism, oppression, and violence that Black people experience in the U.S., in Canada, and all over the world. I support the Black Lives Matter movement and want to be an ally that actively promotes anti-racism. What can I do, or we do, as white people to support anti-racism? I've been doing some research, and here are some tangible things that we can do. We can listen to the experiences of people of color, We can educate ourselves on the ongoing struggles and systematic barriers that they face. We can donate to causes like the Minnesota Freedom Fund or George Floyd's Memorial Fund. There are also other bail funds in major U.S. cities. We can sign petitions. We can demand justice. We can keep having these conversations in our own circles. We can amplify voices that are often not included and we can intervene and call out microaggressions, cultural appropriation, comments or jokes when we witness them. It may be uncomfortable, but I challenge you, like I'm challenging myself, to lean into the discomfort and get real about our complicity and complacency in white supremacy. I really want to acknowledge that I have the freedom, time, and mental capacity to talk about things outside of this urgent fight for racial justice that's happening a la this episode of the podcast and the trivial shit we talk about here because of my white privilege if you need an hour of respite i hope this podcast can be that for you i've shared a bunch of resources and books from the black community on my social media so we can do more than just speak out about it online but how we can take action in our own communities Hey, what's up? It's your host, Tori, and who is ready to be petty? I am back with a very, very special guest. Uh, This has been a long time in the making. Olivia from the Saturday Night Live podcast is here. Welcome, Olivia. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited about this. I think it'll be fun. Yes, it will be. We just recorded her podcast right before this, and we talked all about the Kardashians which we will probably continue this episode. So buckle up. Uh, Liv, what do you talk about on your podcast? Yeah, so I have a podcast called Saturday Night Live Podcast, and it's basically just me rambling about my life. I'm a 24-year-old millennial living in New York City, and I talk about everything from living in New York to dating and relationships, um, entrepreneurship, um, manifestation, kind of whatever I'm into at the moment is what I talk about on my podcast. We love it. She also does these really fun, like, call-in dating shows, which <laughs> I love how you, like, play matchmaker. I, I think my secret dream was to be a matchmaker, and I never knew how to pursue that, so I'm, I'm living out my dreams, you know? <laughs> yeah, you make it happen for yourself. Whenever you say that you live in New York, which is, like, not that you're, like, saying it all the time, but every time it comes up, I just feel like such a hillbilly. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm from the Midwest, so I'm not anything special. I'm from Ohio, so I, I'm probably more of a hillbilly than you are. That's so funny. Yeah, I was like, I went to New York once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just like imagine kind of like the classic like sex in the city like type of living. <laughs> That's what I imagined moving to New York. And I got off the airplane. I remember flying over Manhattan when I was moving officially, like I was on my move, getting off the airplane and was going to stay in New York City. And I'm flying over Manhattan and it's sparkling and magical at nighttime. And I was like, oh my God, I'm like Sarah Jessica Parker. I'm Carrie Bradshaw. Like I'm amazing. And I get off the airplane and there are like homeless people and trash and it smells terrible. I can't find an Uber. Like it was disgusting. And I was like, what have I gotten myself into? I'm like calling my mom running down the street and it's raining and I'm crying. And I'm like, this place is trash. (laughs) So there's, you know, there's good days and bad days. There's definitely, um, like glamorous New York moments, but for, 
like 75% of the time, it's not as glamorous as you would think. That's so funny. Well, we'll still live vicariously through you and your podcast. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about a bunch of things. We're going to talk about Hilary Duff and Lizzie McGuire because we love her. We're huge stands. <laughs> I love her. I'm obsessed. I, ugh, I am just eating up everything she's been putting on social media lately. There's also been lots of drums with Kylie Jenner and uh, Forbes accusing her of not being a billionaire and two (laughs) kind of sad breakups. Uh, I guess we'll chat about if we're sad or not, but Sophia, Richie, and Scott Disick broke up and then Cassie, last name unknown. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's Randolph, right? You're right, Cassie Randolph and (laughs) Colton Underwood also broke up. So let's get into it. Lizzie McGuire had a mini reunion. They did a table read of a episode where Lizzie and Miranda want to buy bras. Did you watch it? Oh, you better believe I watched the whole thing from start to finish and took in, like I soaked in every minute of watching Hillary Duff play Lizzie McGuire because I think like we never knew if we would see this again, you know? I never thought that I would see Hillary play Lizzie again. And then all of the drama with is the show going to happen or not? And then for them to post that table read on Instagram, I was dying inside. Like my 13-year-old self died. Same. Oh, me too, for sure. And she's just she looked so good. Her skin is like glowy. I love her like kind of aesthetic nowadays it just seems so natural and beautiful she's like a glowing goddess she can do no wrong in my eyes like she's just stunning she literally glows and I just love how she's so normal like she never went down that path of you know how child stars can just go down a really dark path and they just come out on the wrong side she just she always stayed humble and cute and had it pulled together I mean she literally dyed her hair green and still looked amazing so that says everything to me. <laughs> kind of has dabbled in some like wild hair colors, but she like weirdly pulls them all off. I know. She can she can just do no wrong. And I love her aesthetic too. She's just like glowing and natural and stunning always. Yeah. I think she's aged really gracefully and you're totally right. She's had like no like big scandals or anything like that. And she's just such a role model for everybody really. <laughs> She literally is. Like, she was my role model when I was, I don't, I'm saying 13. I don't actually remember how old I was when I watched Lizzie McGuire, but still to this day, like, I'm obsessed with her. And I feel like I've been able to relate to her throughout all these years. Like, 10 years later, I'm still in love with her. Yeah, me too. I feel like every time I'm sad, I'll throw on the Lizzie McGuire movie. (laughs) Oh my God, me too. And it gives me the feels every time, like, without fail, I get goosebumps during certain scenes. Like, the beginning scene when she's dancing to, oh, what's the song? Is high. Yes! Sometimes I just listen to that song to feel better <laughs> and pretend I'm her, like, dancing in my room. That's all I need. And I'm like, oh, I'm fine now. Me too. Your new podcast, um, like, cover art is Hillary Duff vibes with the hairbrush. I literally did that because of her. I was like, oh, I'm going to grab a hairbrush and sing into it because that's what Lizzie did. I had to. I love it. What were your other takeaways from the table read? Because I had a few. (laughs) Um, Okay, well, I loved the whole vibe. Like, it felt like they were a family coming back together. And I just think when reunions so many years later happen and people have changed so much over the years and to see them all come together and still get along and have that dynamic, I loved um, some, I literally have a picture pulled up on my phone right now of all of them so I could, like, talk about each individual one. Um, You know... Some of them were a little more awkward than others. Hillary definitely led the whole thing, I think, and kind of pulled it together. Absolutely. What were your takeaways, though? I want to know. I I agree that there, like, seemed to be such, like, a warmth and, like, love between cast members, which, yeah, I agree when I've, like, kind of seen other, like, the, like, 90210 reunion and, like, One Tree Hill and, like, those types of TV shows. It doesn't seem to have this, like really wholesome, caring, yeah, familiar vibe. I, (laughs) I like, the main takeaways for me is, yeah, Hillary was a great leader. Gordo looked really old. (laughs) He looks so old. And I also don't know if he's been on anything else. 
But like, where, where has he been and what has he been doing for the last 10, 12 years? I want to know. Same. I always forget because I always am like, oh my gosh, you haven't like maintained your like stardom and fame. Like you are a failure. But then I'm like, okay, hey, like they were like child actors. Like maybe they didn't want to like continue to act. Like maybe they wanted to pursue other goals. Like I think That's of, so true. I always think of like Harper from Wizards of Waverly Place. She became a nurse. Who was Harper? The best friend. Okay. I remember. I had no idea. That's so funny though, but it makes sense because when you're a child actor, your parents are kind of probably choosing that for you. So there's a great chance that like, you're not interested in doing that after that experience. Totally. And I always am like, oh, you're like a failure. But then I'm like, no, they probably just like pursued other equally rewarding like careers. (laughs) That's very true. I never thought about that. Um, Matt still seems weird. And like, I always wonder like, is it his character or like, is it just like straight up him? I think it's him because you could just see when he was going between being himself at the beginning and then going into his character, nothing changed. (laughs) So true. That is so true. And he's like on TikTok kind of like trying to capitalize on like the Lizzie nostalgia. I did not know that. I need to look that up now. Yes, you do. It's like just as weird as like his like TV character. That's so funny. Lizzie's dad looked rough. (laughs) He looks homeless. Like he really looks like he's been living in the woods for the last 10 years. Yeah. Like if you would have told me that he was like a recluse uh, living in the woods (laughs) with no electricity, I would have been like, yeah, that checks out. (laughs) I, w- I don't think I would have recognized him, honestly. Like, if he walked by me on the street, I wouldn't have been like, oh, my God, you were on Lizzie McGuire. I would not have recognized him. Totally. Yeah, I agree. And Lizzie's mom, it just seemed so, like, motherly. And, like, she dressed up in, like, the white button down and, like, the hair clips and stuff. It was just so freaking sweet. And she looks the same. Like, she doesn't look like she's aged at all. She's stunning. I know. She's beautiful. So I was, like... um very surprised at the difference between her and Lizzie's dad. Like he looks 100 years old and she still looks like she could be like 40. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. He had like some like Gandalf, really long beard, really long hair and like kind of like salt and peppery. (laughs) Totally a little bit rough, but it's fine. Gordo also looks like he's been living in the wilderness, like fishing. He has a mustache going on. Yeah, wasn't digging the mustache at all. And yeah, he just looked really tired. <laughs> yes, I'm look I literally just took a screenshot. He looks exhausted. His eyes are like black. I'm like, are you okay? What have you been doing? Yes, I noticed that too. I was also really surprised that Miranda was there because she seemed not like anti Lizzie, but like she seemed like she didn't really want anything to do with it. I know. I was surprised she was there too. But did you notice that part at the beginning? She like almost cried. She was so like getting really nostalgic. And I was like, that's so sweet. She, you could tell like, I thought in that moment, she seemed really genuinely happy that everyone was there and missing the memories and all of that. And I just thought that was sweet. But I genuinely don't know anything about her or like what happened to her in the last 10 years. Yeah, neither have I. I I think why I thought she didn't want anything to do with Lizzie is because she wasn't a part of the reboot. And it seems like everybody else at least had like cameos in the Lizzie McGuire reboot. That's true. I didn't think about that. Yeah, and she, like, didn't. So I was like, oh, that seems like maybe she, like, wasn't interested in it. But, yeah, so I was, like, pleasantly surprised that she was there. I know. I was, too. I feel like it added that extra bit of nostalgia. And she was a big part of this particular episode that they read. So I was really happy they didn't have a stand-in because I don't think it would have been the same. Yeah, I I was just having flashbacks. I was, too. And I loved how Hillary held up her little alter ego Lizzie every time she did her lines. That gave me all the feels. I loved it. No. And Hillary also had multiple words that she said completely wrong. Like the word oboe, she called it an OB or something like that. And me personally, I would have cringed and died at the fact that millions of people are going to watch this. And I just said, like, read the word oboe as OB. And she just played it off and, like, she's just so confident and flawless. Like, it didn't even bother her. And I was like, yeah, I wish I was that flawless that I could literally say, like, 10 words wrong throughout a script. And no one's going to care because I'm Hillary Duff. 
I know she's so confident and she just seems like she has it all down pat. Yeah. She really does. I love her. Me too. Are you sad that the reboot is currently on hold? Oh, I am so sad. And I think I'm extra sad because I got so hyped up about it and they were starting to do promos about it and talking about it. And Hillary was posting sneak peeks of like an outfit of Lizzie. I think they filmed in like Washington Square Park for the first episode. And it's just like more and more hype. And then all of a sudden they put it on hold. And I guess now, I don't know if it's even confirmed that it will ever happen. Yeah, you're right. But I'm praying that it does because... I was so excited about it. And it's just something that I never thought would happen. Like when you think about a friend's reunion, I just assume someday that's going to happen because it just seems inevitable. But I never, ever expected a Lizzie McGuire reboot. So for for it to just be announced out of the blue, I got extra hyped because I just never thought that that would be a possibility. So I'm still praying that it, it works out. And they've got to see like all of the people who were so excited about it, especially I think our age group, because we were so into it in like middle school. And now I just feel like millennials are super into, like especially girls like us are super into pop culture and Hillary Duff type stuff that we would be such a good target audience that I think they've got to follow through. I really hope they do. It seemed like the issue was uh, Lizzie comes back and she's like 30 years old. So she wanted it to be like, a real 30 year old's experience. And I think that they wanted to like really like Disney plus like that made me so mad too. Cause I'm like, why wouldn't you want it to be like the 30 year old version? Because if your target audience are the girls that did watch Lizzie McGuire, we want to see like the new older version of Lizzie that we can relate to. Absolutely. It seems so weird. And Disney has so many like other networks that they could put it on that just makes sense like I think it was yeah like scheduled for Disney plus but they could put it on like freeform or like any other like ABC or like any other like uh network that has a older audience totally I think I read that they were thinking about putting it on Hulu because that's where they've moved over some things from Disney plus that they didn't think were appropriate quote-unquote which is so silly but I'm really hoping that someone else picks it up because I'm dying for it to happen. It's just my ultimate dream that I didn't know was a possibility until it was announced. And now I'm like, I need it. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, it also does seem weird that they think it's inappropriate because if it's something that like Hillary Duff's doing, like I, it's not going to be like that, like risque. <laughs> no, I almost imagine it being like younger. Have you seen her younger TV show? Of course. <laughs> but I imagine it being similar to that where it's not like it's super raunchy, but it's not like rated G. You know what I mean? Really? So I don't know. I'm hoping they follow through. I'm really looking forward to it. Me too. And like, for some reason I must've been busy or like, I just missed it. But like, I missed the first announcement that it was on hold. And then I saw it like kind of a week after like the news was released. And so I missed kind of all of the like upset and I was pissed. (laughs) Totally. Me too. I'm I'm still holding out hope. I'm praying. I think it will happen because Hillary already has such a big following and so many girls like us want to see it happen. So I think it will. It's just going to be a lot longer. Yeah. And I guess like, especially during this time, like nothing really is filming anyways. So maybe they'll have a chance to like figure their shit out. And then once, yeah, things reopen, they can like start up again. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking too. So fingers crossed. Yeah, that is truly the dream. We also wanted to talk about this recent Kylie Jenner versus Forbes, like the entire company (laughs) story. (laughs) Forbes claimed that Kris Jenner and Kylie Jenner forged their tax like form submission to the magazine uh, when she was put on the like world's billionaire list and dubbed the the youngest self-made billionaire. What are your thoughts? I believe that it's a possibility, but I just don't know what they were thinking or why they would do that because you're already a multi multi millionaire. Like, why do you need to lie about being a billionaire? And I love you wrote in our show notes, do we care? Because her net worth is still 900 million. Like she sells $999 million. Like that last million didn't really matter. But 
yeah, I don't know. I'm just like, I don't care. But also what would be the reasoning behind that? The only thing I could think, I was talking about this with my boyfriend last night because we were researching pop culture things to talk about. And he was like, well, the reason that they probably did it was to make it look like her company was worth more. So when she sold 51% of it to that larger beauty brand, it would have had a higher value that they bought it at. And so I guess the, the brand is called Cody, which I don't know if they have their own beauty, like if they're their own beauty company as well, or if they're just a larger brand that owns multiple companies. I wasn't sure about that. Yeah, I think it's that they own multiple companies. I think it's kind of like a Johnson and Johnson. That's what I thought. Yeah, the only thing that I could think of, and really I didn't think of it, I read it in an article, but I agree (laughs) with this, is that they wanted her to be taken seriously. So if they branded her as a businesswoman on Forbes, like they had that like power suit photo shoot that's like still ingrained in my head that they, that she would just be taken more seriously in the industry. I guess so. It's just so weird to me because it doesn't really matter if she's taken seriously to like other businessmen because her target market are like young girls our age using her makeup and skincare. You know what I mean? If we already take her seriously as like an influencer or someone in the media and we look up to her and we follow her and we buy her products. Like, why does it matter if you're a multimillionaire or a billionaire at that point and you're on the cover? Like, I'm not reading Forbes personally. I'm just buying her walnut scrub at Ulta, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I agree. Like, it seems like a weird, like mismatch. It also is like so weird that Forbes came out with this now because this original article came out like a year or two ago. You know, so I'm like, who is just researching this now? Shouldn't you have done this more thorough research two years ago or whenever this came out? It's just so silly to me. So it almost seems fake. Like someone was just searching for something to come at her for. Yeah. But at the same time, I would not put it past Kris Jenner to like do something sketchy and try to get ahead in the game. Absolutely. I really, truly believe that Kris Jenner runs this world and to not fuck with Chris. I don't know, like, I feel like Forbes will shut down in, like, two to three months. And, wow, they were, like, a thriving company. And then Chris is, like, cackling in her huge Calabasas mansion. That's so funny. I could see it happening. I totally could. I always say, like, the devil works hard, but Kris Jenner works harder because she just has such a grip on, yeah, all of, like, everything in the industry. I know anything in the media having to do with her kids, she like controls. So I don't know how she's going to control this one because Forbes is a pretty big company to take control of, but we'll see what happens with that. I'm sure they've got to come out with some sort of proof or something. Yeah. But it's just, it's a, it's a pretty big, I guess, accusation to make that she forged her tax submissions because I think she could potentially go to jail for that. Yeah. That's what I was wondering too. Cause I was like, did she have to give her like ones that she submitted to the government to Forbes or did she like have to just submit like a letter or like some type of proof to Forbes? Like, I don't know the ins and outs, but anything to do with forgery just seems like a no, no to me. Yeah. I think I read in an article, she could serve up to like a few months sentence in prison, but I just can't imagine Kylie Jenner in prison over tax forgery. So this will be really interesting. (laughs) 2020 is quite the year. (laughs) Literally, I'm going to be following this, I guess. Another thing that you wanted to chat about is like the title of self-made billionaire. Does that like resonate for you with Kylie or do you think that that's kind of like not true? I'm torn on this one. And I was having a debate about this with my friend because on one hand, she's not completely self-made because she was born into a family that was already in the public eye and already was wealthy and whatnot. So she was given a lot of things. But I think even at the point, you know, I mean, I don't know how old she was when she started this business, maybe like 17 or 18 years old, she started her makeup line. Um, But she's only like 20 something, right? Like she's super young. 21. I guess at a certain point, she did technically work her way up to this business. Like she could have 
I mean, look where this is so terrible, but look where Rob Kardashian is. He's been given the same things and he's not a billionaire by any means. He's not doing anything. So it's like at a certain point, she did do the work and made herself what she is today. But I think she was given a head start. I love that. I was literally going to say the exact same thing, which sounds so shady against Rob. And I, I do have this like weird soft spot for him. Me too. Like, I actually like really like him in some aspects. So um, yeah, it, it doesn't mean to be shady, but you're totally right. Like, and even the other sisters, like their trajectories have not been the same as Kylie's. Do you think that it's because of just her age? Because like, younger people would appeal to like a 22 year old where like you and I might relate more even, I guess you're closer to Kylie's age. I'm 27. So I kind of like almost relate more to like the Kim, Courtney, Chloe group. Yeah. I think I relate when I look at like Kim's makeup line versus Kylie's makeup, I've bought Kim's makeup because I think it's more like neutral and minimalist and like simple. But I think Kylie has a huge following because she's the youngest one. Like she's the one that makes YouTube videos, does collabs with young like YouTubers and influencers. Like she's more in that world. And because of that, she is exposed to so many more people in that arena. Whereas Kim is on Instagram and she's on the TV show. And that does, obviously she has a huge following, but I just think Kylie's exposed to that whole younger group that follows YouTube and TikTok and all those things. And I think that that helps her so much in her business. Yeah. That's actually like a really good point that I didn't really think of. Like I think of James Charles did a YouTube collab with both Kylie and then one with Kim. And the one with Kylie just seemed so much more natural because they're like same age. And then the one with Kim, it was just like, kind of like not mother son, but like, I I totally agree. I forgot that he did one with Kim, but Kim tried to go the route Kylie's going. Like she did a collab with Jaclyn Hill and like, she worked with a few different makeup artists, but the ones that Kylie has done are so much more fun and she's young and she's a little more like loose on the camera where I feel like Kim's always very like shoulders back, smile on, have the perfect face. And I think at least the one with James Charles and Kylie, I remember them like laughing a lot and acting like friends and they're like probably the same age. So it just, it feels a lot more natural. And she just reaches that younger audience a lot more seamlessly than I think Kim and the older girls do. Yeah, I totally agree. I also think of like the Kylie cosmetics video where her and Chloe got like absolutely like blackout drunk. I loved that. I loved it. And I think like that type of like fun stuff. Um, yeah, just like maybe is too young for Kim and Courtney and stuff like that. Yeah. And I just think Kim's vibe is a little more serious and she is, she's older and she's doing more serious things. She's becoming a lawyer. So I get that that's, she's not going to post like a drunk makeup tutorial cause that's not her brand. Yeah. But I, I just think Kylie can relate so much more to girls in their late teens, early twenties than Kim can sometimes. Yeah. And that has, I just think that's helped her a lot in her business. And even just like her branding for her makeup line is a lot younger. And I think it's targeted to a younger audience and it's worked in her favor. Yeah. That's so true. So yeah, like the self-made part, it's like you came from an extremely privileged family and before you started your makeup company, there was or already like a decade or like a decade in and a half of like business um, that was set up. But I don't think she's like sitting there. Like I definitely think she's like putting in work. Oh, a hundred percent. I think she's putting in work and I think her mom is putting in a ton of work too. So I think she deserves credit for it. I don't know if she, I don't know if she should be called like the youngest self-made billionaire but she deserves a lot of credit for what she's done with her fame because there, I mean, she didn't have to do anything. She could have literally sat around and done nothing and still had enough money to survive for the rest of her life, probably just based off of the money her mom would give her in the show and being famous. But I think it's really cool that she's built a business that she's passionate about. True. And I kind of think that this is the exact same argument that people were having over Kim 10 years ago. Like, oh, she just capitalized on being herself. And it's like, that's what Kylie kind of did too. And like took a a passion and made it a business. But 
Um, maybe it's just less frowned upon nowadays um, because like Kim really did pave the way for people like Kylie. Oh, totally. And now it's way less frowned upon nowadays because that's kind of what influencers do. You brand yourself and you sell yourself and then you sell products around yourself and merchandise and whatever it is. And Kim was kind of the one of the OGs for that, like her and like Paris Hilton or the girls I'm thinking of that were almost like the original influencers. Totally. So I don't think it's a bad thing, but back then it was maybe a lot more frowned upon. It's like, this girl shouldn't be famous. All she's done is had a sex tape and, you know, taking naked pictures and whatnot. Like that she doesn't deserve this fame that she's been given. But now so many girls do that and it's like so much more common. So yeah, I don't know where I was going with that, but. <laughs> I, I do get that. Like they kind of took being a social light and made it into a career. Like, yeah just using their like family's money they like leveraged it so we love that for them (laughs) we do another kardashian story that happened this week is scott disick and sophia richie broke up i know i i can't tell i don't think i'm sad and i don't think i'm surprised i just think it was inevitable we knew they weren't going to get married like when we just sat down and pictured it it wasn't going to happen it was just a matter of time before it was going to go south. But I feel bad because I think that this was probably one of her like first relationships because she's 21. And that's a really big thing to like date a guy that's 40 years old, has three kids whose ex is in the public eye, a freaking Kardashian. And I don't know, it's a lot of pressure and I'm feeling for her a bit right now. Yeah, I like glad I'm glad that you brought in that compassionate side for Sophia because I was like just gonna be like told you so (laughs) to be honest. (laughs) You're totally right. This is like a huge relationship. And I feel like sometimes with those relationships where people are like, this is never gonna work out and like just wait, this is gonna end in like absolute ruins and heartbreak and stuff like that. And the couple's like, no, we can prove them wrong then they do break up. Like, that's shitty. It is shitty. It's literally like, I told you so and everyone knew it. Yeah. And then you look like the full, but it's just, it's kind of what comes along with being in the public eye, I think. And with dating someone that's 20 years or so older than you, I don't really know how old Scott is. I was assuming he's 40 because didn't Courtney just turn 40? Yeah. He's a few years younger, but like, it's like mid to late thirties. It's a huge age gap. And I just think in the long run, I couldn't see it working out, especially because Scott does put Courtney and his kids before everything else. And you can kind of see that in the show. And I, I, I don't know if that's true, but I read that she was kind of done with being put on the back burner. Yeah. And like, that's fair because yeah, she's young and she like people deserve to be like the number one priority in their partner's eyes. And yeah, it's like, obviously an uphill battle to date someone that, yeah, has to co-parent, has three kids, multiple businesses in one of like, if not the most predominant family in the entire world. Yeah, it's tough. It's really tough. I I feel for her a little bit, but I'm sure she'll be fine. She's beautiful and rich and her dad's Lionel Richie, so she'll be fine. (laughs) She'll for sure bounce back and like maybe find someone that's like just – I was going to say more appropriate, but that sounds so like pearl clutchy, <laughs> but like just <laughs> someone that's more like more her match. Yeah. I don't know who I picture her with, but I don't think it's Scott, but I do think it's funny because I swear her and Courtney look alike to me. Like they have similar facial features, like their face shapes and their noses. And like, when you look at pictures of Courtney, when she was in her twenties, she looks so similar to Sophia. Like she looks like the brunette version of Sophia. And it's so weird to me. Yeah, I definitely think you're right that there's some like similar familiar element. She kind of looks like a mix of Courtney and Chloe. I swear if Courtney and Chloe had a baby, it would be Sophia. That's so funny. I kind of think that this might be a stretch, but do you think that one of the strains on their relationship was when Sophia started becoming like BFFs with Kylie? I kind of wondered that because it's almost like she's involved now with Scott and then she's also helping maybe Courtney co-parent and now she's best friends with Kylie and it's like how much is she going to be in his life and I think sometimes you need a little bit of a separation between maybe your relationship and then like family time or friend time and it's like 
she might have been there for every single thing. And that could just be a lot. And I'm wondering now if it's going to be awkward between her and Kylie now that her and Scott are broken up or if they're still going to be just as close. Totally. I guess right now with quarantine, it's easy to just be like, yeah, we can't see each other because like can't get together and then just kind of like phase them out. But yeah, it would be interesting to see if, yeah, they maintain such a close friendship moving forward. Yeah, we'll see what happens. It'll be interesting. And I feel like Courtney and Scott will always be in each other's lives. And so for that reason, I don't know if Sophia will be just because I think Courtney has staked her claim as like the woman in Scott's life, even though they're not going to be romantically involved. That's her place that she holds. And I just, I don't know if there's room for another girl. Yeah, I completely agree. Do you think that's fair of Courtney? Oh no, I don't think it's fair at all. And I think that she owes Scott a real conversation about like, we will never be together and this is how it is. But I I don't think it's ever going to happen because I don't know if she even recognizes that. Yeah. I think she needs a little bit of therapy, which we all do, but you can just see it in her eyes. Like something's just a little bit off and she doesn't express her emotions and she's got some things bottled up and poor Scott is like hanging on for dear life. And like, I feel like he's always just looking at her. Like, when's it going to happen? Could it happen? Does she like me? What's going to happen? And it's like, the poor guy deserves a break. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you mentioned this when we were chatting on your podcast, but it did kind of seem like circumstances. I think we were talking about Chloe and Lamar, but with Scott and Courtney too, it did kind of seem like it was just circumstances that kind of held them apart. Yeah. Totally. I, yeah, it was like timing and I don't know, but it always seems like it could maybe work out. Yeah. And I just, I kind of blame Courtney, honestly. I feel like she has some deep seated issues and she's, I almost feel like she's not good at expressing love for people. I agree. When she does, it seems so fake and disingenuous. And I'm just like, I don't, it's, I don't think she could ever really have a real relationship unless she works on like some communication skills. <laughs> I agree. And like, I kind of see myself in her in some aspects. Like she almost has like an inability to have a conversation about her emotions. Literally. We see like her like absolutely like blow up with the Kim fight um, this past season that just like, it seemed like it just got to a point because she like could not express like she just seems to hold everything in and just have this like this bottled up like really tight-lipped persona totally even the way she speaks she doesn't say much at all do you remember i think there's a meme or something about her scott's trying to have a serious conversation with her and she just goes a b c d e f g i have to go something like that This entire conversation that we've had, that has been going through my entire head. (laughs) Me too. I keep thinking about it. And it's like, it's the epitome of Courtney because she just, she can't say anything. So she's literally going to say nothing and find a way to leave the conversation. Yeah. And then she just bottles it up. And then that, that fight with Kim almost felt like it was just the tip of the iceberg and she exploded, but it didn't get anywhere because she didn't express anything or solve any problems or communicate anything. It was just physical fighting, which honestly made them look really stupid, but. I know it was not a good look. And I just think with the ABCD thing, like if that was me, like I would literally never leave my house again and like absolutely like Kermit and just like, I could never face anybody, but she like kind of capitalized on it. And like, it became like one of those like TikTok sounds you could like make videos from. (laughs) Like, good for her because, like, I I was having, like, secondhand, like, really cringy embarrassment. Oh, same. But it was just a classic her, I think. It was so classic just saying nothing or having, like, a one. Also, she's the, she is the queen of just saying, okay. Yes. And nothing else. And I'm just, I'm like, really, you have nothing else to say? At least every other sister has content and, like, things to talk about and share. And she just is like, okay, A, B, C, D, F, G, I have to go. Yeah. <laughs> she will say K when she's like not even in agreement with somebody. No, she'll just like K. It's like when you're texting your boyfriend and you're like, it's fine. Everything's fine. And you're pissed and you just write a single K, but she just does that IRL all of the time. Yeah, literally. She is the queen of, I think she started just saying K. She is like, she's the OG K or 
Yeah, she truly is. Yeah. And like, honestly, I, I, we've been talking a lot of shit about her, but I, I do like her. Like, I like her too. And I like that she's a bit different than her sisters in terms of like her beliefs and being more organic and like kind of standing up to them on wanting to parent differently and whatever. So good for her because I think it's really hard in that family to be different and they're all constantly comparing each other. And I'm sure she has so many great aspects. And I think her personality type doesn't come across well on camera because she can't really speak her mind. Yeah. So I'm sure she's much more amazing in person than that maybe the show makes her look. Totally. And I wonder, one of the things that I've been thinking about is like, has this been a defense mechanism that she's just like adapted because like she clearly doesn't want to be a part of the show anymore? It could be. She's just like, I'm not going to share my emotions. So I'm just going to say, okay, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. I'm going to avoid going to filming. And I, it seemed like this season was the season she finally admitted like, yeah, I don't want to do this. But it was weird how she kind of still was on it in the last few episodes, even though they made a huge deal about her leaving and then she was there. So I don't really know what happened. I know. And like, I know that sometimes like episodes like weirdly get taped like out of order. That's true. Or they rejig it. So it makes like a storyline that didn't truly like happen or play out that way in real life. But yeah, it seemed like if I watched like season one, I feel like she wasn't like giving one word answers all the time and like she could have conversations or would even like bring like storylines to the TV show. And yeah, I wonder if this is like her true personality or just like her TV like persona. I don't know. It almost feels like it's just her personality that has formed from being like pent up anger over the years from maybe her family. I feel like she's got a lot of things with her sisters that she hasn't worked out. I feel like she has pent up aggression toward her mom that she hasn't solved. I feel like they even talked about how didn't her mom cheat on her first husband, Robert Kardashian at some point. And it seemed like Courtney was still like holding that against her. I feel like she's got a lot of past traumas she needs to work through, which is funny. Like reading articles, she told Scott he needs to go to rehab for his past traumas. And I'm like, girl, sign up with him. <laughs> Literally like, go together there's some unresolved issues and maybe again that's why her and Scott didn't work out that it's just two people with a lot of shit going on totally another sad break sad question mark <laughs> breakup Cassie and Colton from The Bachelor broke up again are we sad about this or are we even surprised I was actually both sad and surprised about this one I was, I'm here staying with my boyfriend for a week in New York and I was standing in his kitchen and I saw Cassie's post, like it's with a sad heart. I have to like announce that we broke up and I literally like screamed, oh my God. My boyfriend was like, what's wrong? Like Cassie and Colton broke up. I just think it seemed a bit out of the blue because they've been quarantined together for the last like two months and Colton had coronavirus and she like nursed him to health and they're going to come out of this and break up. Like I was so shocked. And I genuinely really liked them together on the show. I think Colton Baby is a little too good for Cassie. Like I felt like she didn't fully appreciate how sweet he was. But after like following them on Instagram and like watching their videos together and kind of following them after the show, I really fell in love with them as a couple. And I'm really, really sad to see them break up. She always seemed like she had one foot out the door, especially during the filming of The Bachelor. But... I feel like with bachelor couples, once they've made it like say three or six months post show, I'm like, okay, this is like a legitimate relationship. So I guess in that aspect, I was surprised, like similar to like Caitlin and Sean, not that they like compare at all. Cause I don't even think Cassie and Colton were living together, but yeah. Um, like it just seems like, okay, this is like a legitimate relationship. So yeah, I, I, I was surprised in that aspect. It just, yeah, seemed to be out of the blue. But then I think about how they got together. And yeah, I, I think Cassie was like always not as into it as Colton was. I agree. And I, I'm so curious about who broke up with who or if it was a mutual decision. When did that conversation happen? Because they've been quarantined together for so long. I'm like, have you just not been together? But you were just – because I, I believe they were quarantined at her parents' house – 
And then he got coronavirus and like lived in their attic or something. And she would like bring him stuff for two weeks. But I was shocked and I'm really sad about it. And I thought that they were going to make it in the long haul. I'm like, wow, they've been through this together. She like took care of him when he had this deadly disease and they're going to come out of this stronger than ever. And then they broke up, but they made a big deal about how they're going to be friends. And this is like a new chapter for them. So it'll be interesting to see how they deal with being friends while also seeing each other date in the public eye. That will be very interesting. Yeah. How do you think that's going to go for them? (laughs) I can see Cassie easily moving on and being cool. And I can see Colton like crying in his room alone at night. Like there's no doubt in my mind. If I had to say anything for certain, it's that Cassie is going to start dating like a basketball player, like another football player, like within three months. And Colton is going to be absolutely devastated. I feel the same way. And I feel bad for him already. I'm like, you're not going to handle this well, buddy. And you can kind of tell he's a little bit more sensitive maybe than she is because especially on the show he was so in love with her and like lovey-dovey and like all over her and she was a little bit like meh so I just I'm a little bit nervous how he's going to handle this but they acted like they're so mutual about this breakup and it's going to be fine and they're going to be friends but I feel like he's gonna he's in for a rude awakening I agree yeah both of their posts when I read them it did sound so mutual but then I just think about and maybe this is his love language and it's not hers but like how many like Insta stories and like posts were him like posting about Cassie just like blabbing on about how she's like a literal angel and like she just like never seemed to reciprocate. I agree. I and I feel bad for him because I just I think he deserves so much and he's so sweet and wholesome and it's funny because I think he's one of those guys that wasn't he kind of like chubby when he was younger or wasn't there a whole joke about how he wasn't cute and now he's like totally like come into his own yes so I think he's one of those guys that has the heart of like a chubby fat kid but like now he's super hot and so he has like the personality and the looks but he doesn't think he's hot because he still like sees himself as the chubby fat kid and I just think that's so sweet and wholesome and she just appreciate it like I do (laughs) Uh, I totally agree that he like seems to carry those like insecurities it's kind of like that movie that Ryan Reynolds movie yes I was just thinking of that I forget what it's called but he has like a fat suit on and he's like that funny fat friend and then he comes back home and he's Ryan Reynolds (laughs) (laughs) and yeah like tries to win back his like high school crush so that's such a cute movie that's kind of how I think of Colton I'm like I feel like he sees himself as the old version of himself so he's still at heart has that like personality and like sweet sensitive side to him but now he's like ripped True. And really hot and was a football player. And I just, I feel like Cassie's missing out. And I, I kind of feel like she instigated the breakup, even though they're saying it's mutual. Same. But I, I could be wrong. Yeah. Do you think that they'll date people in Bachelor Nation or do you think they'll go elsewhere? I was trying to think about this today. When you just said like Cass, you can see Cassie dating a basketball player. I can see that now. I didn't think of that option until you said it. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. That's 100% what's going to happen. She's going to date an athlete. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of bachelor girls do if they don't find someone like on bachelor in paradise or like kind of like other influencer type people. Um, I think that they often date. Yeah. Like basketball, football. I can see her doing that. Cause didn't, wasn't she on a TV show when she was in college and she was dating an athlete? Yeah. I can't remember if he was an athlete, but yeah, that was like her, big previous relationship that she talked about a lot was her on like a very religious TV show about like her university experience, which is like so weird to me. I think that her ex is like a professional soccer player, but I could be wrong, but I think that's what I heard. So I, and then Colton's a former football player. So it sounds like there's a good chance she's moving on to an athlete, another athlete. She might have a, a type. Yeah, for sure. This is um, not easy to talk about, but do you think that he's upset that he's lost his virginity um, to not his wife? Because that was, I was like, this is awko to talk about. But then I was like, this was literally his entire persona on his season of The Bachelor was his virginity. And then he wrote his book, basically heavily implies that Cassie and him had sex do you think he feels like 
bad that it wasn't with, cause I, he was like always saving himself for marriage is engagement. Like basically the same, like, is that enough? I, I feel like the bachelor always plays up one aspect of whoever is on the show and that they define them with that one thing. So I have a feeling Colton doesn't like, yes, I think he was saving himself for someone special, but I feel like it wasn't as big of a deal as maybe producers made it out to be on the show. I feel like maybe he was just waiting to be in a serious relationship or be with someone he saw like a potential with in the future. So I feel like he's going to be okay. But also, I don't know for sure, but I think he's a a strict Christian maybe. So there's a chance that like he's very disappointed. But in my eyes, I'm like, you were in a serious relationship. You saw a future with her. Like you don't regret anything, you know? Totally. Yeah. That's, I hope the takeaway that he has for sure. I actually do agree that you're right. He probably talked about it like a handful of times throughout the two month like filming period. And they just made a cohesive storyline that was literally all about this. But yeah, I don't know. Like he talks about it in his book as well. That was like one of the selling points is like, again, capitalizing on like talking about his virginity so definitely made that like his thing and he kind of rolled with it I think as like the virgin of the show um but I was trying to figure out who I would pair him with now in Bachelor Nation and I'm wondering if him and Maddie Pruitt from Peter's season would be a fit because she's also saving herself for marriage and she's a strict Christian and she's an athlete and she's cute and young and around Cassie's age maybe younger but I could kind of see it Okay, this is why you are a matchmaker on your own podcast because that's actually such a good fit. You're totally right. They have like a lot of the same core values. They're from the same crazy experience together. Yeah, they kind of live that influencer lifestyle. They're like kind of like chill, like mild type people. Like, Yeah, I know. I could really see it. And he used to date the... Olympian, what's her name? Yes, Allie Raisman. Yes, Allie Raisman. I actually met her one time. Uh, I went to an Aerie event and she was there and she was so cool. But I feel like Maddie Pruitt almost reminds me of a mix of like Allie Raisman and Cassie a little bit. Like she's a little more like influencer y and maybe like fashion and like beauty oriented than Allie is. But then she's also an athlete and like Christian and like very chill and down to earth and grounded. Like I could see her being a perfect fit. Okay, I love this. Like, should I tweet at Colton? <laughs> the day after they they break up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe I'll strategically wait a few weeks. You should. I'm I'll be shocked if no one else has thought of that idea. I literally was just scrolling through Instagram and like, who do I follow from Bachelor Nation? I was like, oh my God, she would be a perfect fit with him. I could see it. Yeah, totally. Does she live in the like LA area? I don't know. I know she's hung out with like Selena Gomez. Did you see that? I was shocked. And people were saying, she, they were like, how disrespectful is Maddie Pruitt? She's at Target shopping for board games with Selena Gomez and she's just texting on her phone. Yeah. But like at me, like I was like, if I was with Selena Gomez, like I would like throw my phone away. Like Yeah, I would never need my phone again. I don't need to speak to anyone else for at least a year. Like, that's all I need. I would never pick up my phone. Like, I would be so, like, trying to make a good impression that, I like, I wouldn't need to, like, look at, like, Instagram. I know. I was dying at that. So maybe she lives in LA. I'm not sure. There's also a chance she, like, goes in between, like, living at home. Is she from Alabama? Was that it? Probably. I'm sure she goes between like staying at home in Alabama and like visiting LA because it seems like she's made a lot of like celebrity friends in LA. Yes. Yeah. I I think you're right about um, the Alabama thing because I feel like people were like, oh, Peter's just like dating the new Hannah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. But also I feel like just like 50% of Bachelor Nation is from Alabama at this point. So, <laughs> so just like a good guess. That's so true. That is so true. This week in Petty is back. Olivia, what's been on your mind lately? Okay, I want to be petty about Call of Duty because I think it's just something that I don't get. And I've never really gotten video games. I've just never understood them. And I get so annoyed because I'm like, why? What are you doing? Why are you playing this in the middle of the day? 
you have a job. Like my boyfriend's working from home and he'll, it'll be like noon. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to hop on and play some Call of Duty. And he's on there for like two hours. And I'm like, is this okay? And then they're, they're all talking to each other. And my, my boyfriend doesn't stop talking for like the full hour he's playing Call of Duty. He's just like screaming things. And I'm like, are you screaming in other people's ears? Like, do you know these people? Who are you talking to? And it's just, it's violent and it's loud. And I don't like it. <laughs> I was going to ask that question because I'm not familiar with Call of Duty, but so people talk to each other. That is such a weird concept to me. Yeah, it's weird, but I think he's like on there. I'm going to sound so stupid. He's going to listen to this and be like, you know nothing, but I think he gets on there with his friends. Like he texts his friends and he's like, hey, let's all play Call of Duty. And they all meet up in their little like armor and their uniforms with their like, and I don't know, but he has a little headset he wears. And I'm like, you look like the biggest nerd right now. And he's screaming like, yeah, go get that guy. Watch your back. Oh my God. Like I just died. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, first of all, you didn't stop. You didn't take a breath for an hour. Like you didn't stop talking. So you're either all talking over each other or you just like took over the whole conversation. Everyone just had to listen to you scream for an hour. I totally get that. This is like just something so different for guys. Like connecting with their friends than how we would connect with our girlfriends. I just don't get it. And he's always like, yeah, I'm not just going to sit and like call my guy friends up and like have a zoom call and like drink wine and chat. And I'm like, you don't talk about anything. You guys are just like killing people and screaming. Like, how are you catching up on each other's lives? You're literally not. That is like so funny to me. And I really feel like that is like kind of, I don't want to generalize, but I really feel like that is it. Like guys talk about like topics in like like what's going on or like an activity that they're doing where like we're often like getting into like the juicy stuff I know like I literally just want to sit and chill and have a conversation I don't need to be actively playing a sport or doing a game or like watching football or playing call of duty like I just want to sit and chill and have a drink and like chat and he's like, no, I don't need, yeah, like I talked to my friends today and I'm like, no, you didn't talk to your friends. You played Call of Duty and screamed for three hours. Like that is not catching up with your friends. <laughs> so funny. You're like, that's not talking. <laughs> I think like for me and maybe I just like have anxiety about this, but like if I was ever playing a game, I would like not want people to be able to like watch. Oh no. Same. I just couldn't like handle the pressure. And if someone was yelling at me, I just couldn't do it. I know. And I'll be sitting in a nearby room and I can hear him screaming and it's so loud. I'm like, those their poor ears because they're all wearing those nerdy video game headsets. I'm like, their eardrums are going to explode with the way you are screaming about Call of Duty right now. It's so unnecessary <laughs> to me. Full on. Yeah, he full on screams. It's just so ridiculous. And he has like dual monitors and like there's different Call of Duty things happening on the monitors. And I'm just like, I don't know what's going on, but it's just too much to handle. I love that. Yeah. I feel like people are getting more into these types of things um, because of quarantine. Like every second tweet on my Twitter is about like Animal Crossing. (laughs) I actually, my boyfriend got me Animal Crossing because he's like, you need something to do while I play Call of Duty. And I was like, this is going to be so stupid. And now I'm like five days into Animal Crossing and I can't put it down. Are you like addicted? I feel like honestly, I'm not buying one only because I would be obsessed with it. I'm addicted to it and I'm so upset that I'm going back to Ohio in a couple of days because I'm not going to have Animal Crossing and I don't know what I'm going to (laughs) do. Goodness. Yeah. Like that's the withdrawal like that I just could not handle right now. No, don't get it. It's not worth the addiction. And I thought it was going to be so stupid because I've never played video games. I've never been into that. And now I'm like, shit, this is actually really fun. I feel like I'm not a video game type person, but there's something about Animal Crossing. I don't know if it just seems like peaceful or like easy, like there's no like high stakes that it's something I would play. That's why I get Animal Crossing and I don't get Call of Duty because Call of Duty is so anxiety inducing. Like you hear there's, there's noises, people are screaming, it's like high intensity and Animal Crossing is like this chill music and you like make a little character and you like go fishing and you have a little island and you go shopping and it's so cute. And I'm like, this is what video games should be for. Like I just want to chill and numb out. I don't want to be in this crazy war zone, like screaming at people. It's just, that's what I don't get about Call of Duty. And I just, yeah, thanks for letting me be petty about that because apparently I had some pent up anger about it. I didn't know I had within me. The only like thing that I kind of like see or like can relate to about this is I recently got into Drive to Survive. What's that? 
is, um, this actually sounds awful, but I actually think you might like it too, but it's about, it's a Netflix a TV show about Formula One racing, which obviously it's like, why would we watch that? But literally all of the drivers are hot and it's like a reality TV show about like the racing, not actually like about the races. That's so interesting. Actually like really good. I highly recommend if you like reality TV shows because yeah, you follow like these really high pressure situations, but they also wear the full headsets and all of the like drivers have this huge team and they're all barking orders at them all of the time. And it just seems so stressful. And I've learned so much. I actually like have the utmost respect for Formula One drivers. That's so interesting. It's on Netflix. I'll have to watch it. It's on Netflix. They're like usually European, like from like Monaco or like there's this really hot guy from Australia and it's like really fun to watch. But the situation just seems like Call of Duty IRL. It's like just a bunch of guys yelling at each other. That's so funny. Well, maybe I can watch it with my boyfriend and he'll enjoy the racing aspect of it and I'll enjoy the like reality TV aspect of it and we can bond over that. It's like this weird mix of like, it's the in the moment interviews, just like Kardashians and Bachelor. And yeah, obviously racing is a part of it, but you also follow them like celebrating their wins and like uh, inter-team drama. So maybe that's something that, yeah, you two can spend the rest of your quarantine binging. That's so fun. I'll have to check it out. That actually sounds pretty good. I highly recommend. I did not think I was going to like it based on mine and seemingly your interests, but it's really good. So I think that's it from us. Thank you so, so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. I didn't realize how much we would have to talk about. I feel like we could literally talk for like five more hours. I agree. This happens to me all the time. I'm like, oh, people don't want to listen to a six hour podcast. Like, (laughs) oh no. So where can the listeners of Ready to Be Petty follow you? Yeah. So if you want to listen to my podcast, Saturday Night Live podcast, you can find me on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or anywhere else that you listen to your podcasts. And you can follow me on Instagram at Saturday Night underscore live. And if you want to follow me on Pinterest, it's Olivia Legaly, L-A-G-A-L-Y. I low-key love Pinterest and I'm still obsessed with it. I might be one of the last few, but if anyone else out there is obsessed with Pinterest like I am, please follow me. (laughs) I love this. Maybe I should reignite my love of Pinterest while you watch Drive to Survive. Yes, please do. I would love it. Please connect with me on Pinterest. I need someone else to bond over Pinterest with because I feel like everyone else has given up on it and I'm like the last person on Pinterest, but I swear I have more views on Pinterest than I do on any of my other social media. I think I get like 5,000 monthly viewers on my Pinterest. Like, that's a testament to your great style. Follow Olivia on Instagram. She's always tie-dyeing, like, yeah, we stan. That's so funny. Yeah, I'm all, I love creating things. That's very true. But yeah, if you want to follow me on Instagram and, like, learn more about me, it's Saturday night underscore live. Yeah, and like I mentioned in the podcast, we just recorded an episode of Saturday Night Live. We talk about the same type of shit that we talked on this episode. Uh, We did a deep dive into the Kardashians and each member of the family and a bunch of recent stories that they've been involved in. So definitely go take a listen. Yeah. Anyways, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. Thanks again for listening. If you like what you hear, join our Ready to Be Petty Facebook group so we can talk about more pop culture stories together. You can also follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and our Facebook page at RTPP Podcast. I hope you and your family stay safe and healthy. As always, I'm Tori and I'm ready to be petty. See you soon. Bye.